Michael Brach or Dr. Mike, which most people call him, is a licensed doctor of physical therapy, a former amateur fighter, former kinesiology professor, and an internationally certified fight referee. In addition to treating individual patients, Dr. Mike runs group exercise programs steeped in leading evidence from physical therapy and exercise science to help people with chronic and progressive conditions move and feel better. Plus, he is one of our most favorite people on the entire planet, and we're so excited to have him back today. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to let you uh, do what you're going to do, and I'll get off. All right. Thanks, Mel. That's quite an intro. And uh... I don't know when the last time is that I laughed as hard as I did during Dr. Haug's uh, presentation. It, similarly, um, I too struggled without having a group to present to, to be able to see your faces and know what's going on. And since I run a PT clinic that's also a boxing and martial arts gym, you'll get a kick out of this. I've got a, a Bob punching bag there. Social distancing policies on as my audience. So, uh, so that way, there's at least somebody here with me. Um, I'm going to learn how quickly to share my screen. Figured that one out, I think. And um, let's get going. This will be this will be great. I love these things because just like everybody else here, I'm so passionate about helping people with Parkinson's. Some of my favorite people in the world had Parkinson's at a time where uh, as a healthcare community, we just didn't know as much as we do now. And uh, if there had been resources like what the Davis Finney Foundation puts together, and if there had been the wealth of scientific uh, and healthcare information available back then that there is now, it just amazes me what could have been possible. So uh, I love that we get to do this and I love that uh, we know so much now that we didn't know about mobility, about the role of the mind-body connection, about uh, the role of exercise in treating motor as well as non-motor impairments. Um, and at the same time, while I could probably ramble about this stuff for hours, uh, we could probably also just summarize this talk by saying, get moving. And you might say, well, what should I do? What's the best kind of exercise for people with Parkinson disease or some form of Parkinsonism? And I'll say, well, the kind that you'll do uh, consistently, but then also the kind that you'll do safely. Because I know uh, while there is a whole wide array of available symptoms, just because something's on the menu doesn't mean you're gonna get it. Um, and at the same time, we don't know uh, how different people progress. Everybody progresses a little bit differently. So if you can find ways to stay active consistently and safely, that's the number one thing you can do to manage symptoms. To be clear, I still think you should take medication as prescribed by your movement disorder specialist. Uh, but in addition to that, wow, exercise is just such a life changer. And it's a big deal for everybody, but that's even more true for people with Parkinson's. I've got some disclosures here. You've got access to the slides, but essentially um, I'm really biased. I do this for a living. I get to help people work out to fight back against their symptoms every day, and it is fantastic. So of course I'm biased. So, uh, there's plenty of stuff out there that I'm not going to talk about because there's not time. So I'm just sampling some of the research that's out there. And most importantly, if you're going to start doing something new, if you're going to try something new, I sincerely hope that you'll run it by your care team first. Um, and usually what I find at these uh, victory summits is people already have a great care team in place. And if you don't, through using resources like you can get from the Davis Finney Foundation, uh, it's pretty easy to plug into a great care team. And along those lines too, this isn't on the disclosure, it's not even on my slides, but something I always try to make sure of is anybody that I see in physical therapy or in our group programs or anybody I speak with that has Parkinson's or knows someone with Parkinson's, I try to make sure, uh, and if you don't have this yet, please get it. I try to make sure that you hop on the Davis Finney Foundation website 
and you track down what is, in my opinion, the single best resource for people with Parkinson's, the Every Victory Counts Manual. Because just like today, you know, you had Dr. Hamilton, you had Dr. Hogg, I'm here, you've got all these people speaking um, to you about how to do well with Parkinson's. Uh, if you're like me, you might forget some of it. Or you might say, well, man, that's just your opinion. Uh, and this way, you know, something like the Every Victory Counts Manual, there are over 40 authors, all of whom sp specialize in helping people with Parkinson's. It, it's the best thing out there. So please track down a copy of that. Let's talk about what we're gonna dig into today though. We're gonna dig into how exercise helps uh, and some key components from exercise. So uh, as we do that though, I also like to remind people, since I worked hard to get my doctorate in physical therapy, and since I work hard to maintain my license, um, and since I know that group exercise programs are incredibly helpful, can't do it all for you. My sincere hope is that each and every one of you uh, consider doing at least an annual check-in with a licensed physical therapist um, because they can come up with a customized program for you. So I've got some reasons that are, that are worth going to physical therapy uh, or in the current environment, you should also know that as of Thursday, so that just, just a couple days ago, Thursday of this week, CMS, which is the Center for Medicare Services, they oversee Medicare and Medicaid. They approved, uh, finally, for physical therapists to be um, uh, approved providers uh, of telehealth services. So now, even if you're social distancing, or even if you're staying at home and sheltering in place, uh, which I certainly would encourage many people to do, uh, there's no sense in taking on unnecessary risks. Even if that's the case, you can use telehealth now to access physical therapy too. And Medicare, if you're a Medicare patient, will cover it. That's wonderful news. Uh, the other thing that's great about that is you might say, well, hey man, I'm not on Medicare yet. Uh, I've got private insurance. The good news is private insurance companies usually follow suit with what Medicare does. It doesn't always happen, but it often happens. And so now that that change has occurred, there's a lot of exciting stuff. But you could go to a PT to work on your walking. You could go to a PT to work on your balance. You could go to a PT to manage joint pain. Um, in fact, a lot of folks that I see in physical therapy, uh, I know them because they have Parkinson's disease. But what I end up treating with them often are orthopedic issues that are a result of just living life um, that have been worsened by their Parkinson's symptoms. So maybe, uh, maybe you already had a bad back before you were diagnosed with Parkinson's. Well, with rigidity, with dystonia, with other symptoms from Parkinson's, there's a good chance that could flare up. Uh, and so it makes sense to see a PT for that too. So uh, I'm not here to give you a whole discourse on what physical therapists do, but I do wanna remind you that's an important part of your care team. And I sincerely hope that you have a good one you can, you can call on. And if you don't, just keep looking. PTs are everywhere. Uh, here is the textbook cartoon uh, guy with Parkinson's. And many of you have probably seen or experienced some of these symptoms. I bring this up because a lot of folks that I see when they, when they first come to see me, um, they haven't been active in a while, they want to exercise or maybe due to apathy from non-motor symptoms, they want to want to exercise, uh, or maybe they don't even want to exercise, but somebody who cares deeply for them has brought them to see me anyway, um, in the hopes that maybe we can talk to them and give them one more reason to try. Um, so, so these are the symptoms that, that usually present uh, in some form or fashion. And the good news is for almost all of the symptoms here on the list, uh, exercise can make a powerful difference. So the general idea is, uh, as a lot of people say, use it or lose it. A lot of other people say, maybe use it and improve it. Uh, so, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, tremor is usually handled more by your medication, but rigidity, 
postural control, that forward trunk lean, the reduced arm swing, the shuffling gait, balance problems, all of these things can be worked on. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy all the time, but usually things that are the most worth it in life aren't easy anyway. So uh, hopefully it's helpful to hear that with some consistent effort, you can work on all of those symptoms. And there's such a wealth of research that backs all of this. So here's a classic quote from Dr. Daniel Korkos who says, what you already know, which is exercise helps everybody anyway. Exercise is medicine for the general population. The drawback, as all of you know, is um, it's not as fast as medicine, right? Uh, but, but for people with Parkinson's, the good news is you can have an immediate uh, modification of signs and symptoms. So more so than the general public, I find that people respond more quickly to exercise in terms of reducing the severity of their symptoms or feeling well and living well and moving well despite their symptoms than the general public. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and there are great studies out there like this one that show, uh, and this one I, I like to highlight because it's not just expert opinion, it's not just the experience of 10 or 20 people, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis, which means it's a study of studies. So we've got in this study that came out in 2013, 18 different studies wrapped up into one that show aerobic exercise more so than strength training, more so than other types of exercise to be helpful in having immediate beneficial effects. That doesn't mean don't do the other stuff, but it does mean, uh, like you've heard, if you can get on a walking program, if you can get on a treadmill, if you can dust off the elliptical machine that you're using as uh, an additional hanger in your garage, or um, if you can dust off the old bow flex or whatever you got lying around uh, and use it, uh, that's a good thing. But if you can do something that gets your heart rate up, um, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming, it doesn't have to be incredibly intense, but if it can be a little bit more uh, intense or a little bit faster than your self-selected pace would be, you can have these immediate effects that improve motor action, the ability to move more quickly, improve your balance and improve your walking. That's fantastic news. And behind the scenes, what's working here? What's working behind the scenes is a really fancy term called neuroplasticity. And uh, it really can be summarized by stuff you already know. Uh, but, but the fancy way of breaking it down is just saying, how do you make lasting changes in connections in the brain? And in the face of something that normally wants function to simply go downhill to be able to make lasting changes in the brain, well, that might even help you to create uh, compensatory strategies or uh, strengthen existing pathways to keep what you've got. Uh, and, and that comes back also to aerobic exercise playing a role because aerobic exercise is incredibly helpful for uh, slowing the progression of symptoms. And, and that happens because it can induce or, or kind of kickstart this process of neuroplasticity. That also happens for a lot of other reasons. You get more blood flow in the brain, you get more oxygen delivered to the brain. So when we talk about uh, some of the things Dr. Hamilton mentioned, for example, of um, non-motor symptoms or some of the things Dr. Haug uh, ex explained like, you know, fatigue. We talked about uh, lack of attention. We talked about apathy. We talked about bowel and bladder function so far. All of these things can be improved by aerobic exercise. Uh, and, and that happens for a number of reasons, but it's great to know that you don't just have to take pills and sit and wait. You can take your medication and then you can take positive action. And I, I think for a lot of people that I work with, um, it's incredibly helpful to realize you're in the driver's seat of how well you do in fighting this thing. And yes, there are things that are out of your control, but there's so much that's within your control and exercise and building the discipline to do that can help with far-reaching benefits. So uh, 
let me continue on here. You might say to yourselves, well, what do you mean neuroplasticity? And I gotta warn you, like you heard in the intro, I used to do a lot of amateur fighting. I'm very fortunate I got to tour around the country uh, doing that for many years. Uh, so I'm very partial to things like boxing or if your balance is great, kickboxing or, um, you know, just last week we, we celebrated world, a worldwide event called World Tai Chi Day. I've taught Tai Chi for years and I adore it. Um, but why don't we try some of these principles of neuroplasticity right now? And if you're doing this at home, I have some requests for you. One request is that you do it safely. So make sure you don't have any clutter that you could trip on or anything. Make sure that, uh, you know, if your balance is off, that you just do it from a chair, something like that. So, uh, you know, I think it's fun to do a little boxing work. See, I almost just tripped on this chair. So it's good to look around and say, hey, is this a safe area to exercise? For boxing, what I like to do to start out is just to get into some technique basics. And so I like to have people put one foot back, one foot a little bit forward, get a slight bend in the knees, hips forward, back up straight, head up high. It's safe to say right now, if your left foot is your front foot, that your left hand is your front hand. It's also safe to say that if your right foot is your back foot, that your right hand is your back hand. And so what we can do here is we can just work through uh, a few basics of boxing to try and put some of these principles of neuroplasticity into action. And, and one idea is the more you do something, the easier it is to do. So if we're in our good stance with our hands up, we want our hands at least up to cheek level because we want to stay pretty. Also, when you think about that stooped posture that's so common with Parkinson's, if your hands are down here, it's a lot harder to have really good uh, fighting stance. But if you're thinking about bringing your hands up, it's easier to stick your chest out, keep your head up, and work on that postural control. And what we can do is with that front hand here, we can just reach out and pull back up high. Reach out and pull back. And you don't have to go hard. You don't have to punch with all your might. But you can see how, you know, if you did 10 of these a day, well, that might be something. But in the course of a boxing workout, you're probably gonna throw several hundred jabs. And so that jab is where we reach out with the front hand and pull back. And you can see also how if you do something over and over and over, it's easy to keep that motor program and those uh, neural connections healthy in the brain. So you might say, well, hey, Mike, uh, that's great. I'm glad that I'm preserving the ability to throw a mean jab. I suppose if I met somebody in a dark alley, that might come in handy. But then you could also say, well, hang on a second. Isn't functional reaching activity important every day? Doesn't this also mimic something that's common from every day of reaching out into a cabinet to grab a cup of coffee or maintaining upright posture and balance and control of your balance while you reach for something. So you can tie a lot of things uh, from exercise into functional movements from daily life. Or you might say, is there an activity I'm struggling with in daily life? Well, perhaps I can build elements of that into my exercise program. So we've been doing a lot of jabs. And I know also a lot of folks that I see have problems when they suddenly have to turn. They say, if I can plan something coming up, I do okay. But if I quickly have to turn, that's when I get off balance. And in boxing, we get to do a lot of that because we get to do a lot of pivoting. So when we throw punches like the hook, for example, and I'm showing you my feet here, we're in our fighting stance. With the hook, you pick your front heel up. If you're throwing a hook off the front, you pick that heel up. You've got to keep more weight on the back leg, but then you can turn in and turn back. So you can turn in, whip the heel out, and turn back. And that's helpful because that gives us a little bit of a vestibular challenge for our balance. Also, it gives us that nice direction change. But on top of that, we're getting good weight shifting and 
when you think about punching power, a lot of folks that I see in our boxing classes, and I feel so fortunate I've gotten to study the role of non-contact boxing on impairments of Parkinson's for the last three years now. Uh, but when you think about where the power comes from in those punches, pivoting and turning in on the hips is what really makes that punching bag thump. And when you think about stress relief, hitting stuff, my friends, big stress reliever. So uh, that brings us up to another idea of neuroplasticity. So if we're jabbing or if we're throwing the hook, and let's just do a few of them. Jab, hook, jab, hook. Let's do 10 of them. Jab, hook, jab, hook, jab, hook, jab, hook. I already lost count. Jab, hook, just kidding. Here's the 10th. Jab and hook. We're counting also, so we're building uh, awareness or we're using that executive function while we're exercising. We know that that is also helpful for uh, for a lot of things when it comes to balance and motor control. Um, somehow I lost you on my screen. I took your screen sharing off because I needed people to be able to see you. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I can, we can turn it back on. No, no, this is perfect. I just thought maybe I messed something up. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> um, when we get to do those things, and when we get to do them over and over and over, you get to experience a number of things. You get to experience first, uh, improved connections in the brain to preserve motor patterns for daily function. But also, we get to get better at a new skill or uh, improve an old skill. And when you think about cognitive function, this is one more way exercise can play a significant role there. When you begin to punch stuff, there's incredible stress management and stress relief. And on top of that, one of the reasons I love my job is we do so many group programs. And with those, we get to build a sense of community. And, and so that's one thing that I'm hopeful you'll take away from this is not just hey, go out and work out, but try to find some ways to connect with people because um, it's a lot easier to show up and it's a lot easier to show up consistently when you've got a group. Another thing we like to do in our boxing classes that is significantly easier to do with a group is squatting. And I've moved the chair back here. For this, if you're doing it at home, I like to put it against a wall so that way, it's just more stable. But you could say, well, why would I squat? Well, you'd squat because the more you do it, the easier it is to do, right? We've covered that. But it makes it easier for daily function, like getting on and off the toilet, getting in and out of a car, getting on and off the couch. And so you don't have to go crazy with it, but I think good squatting form works well. Feet out wide, toes straight ahead, back up straight, and, and if you have a chair with arms, if you're a little bit weaker, it's good to have the arms so you can hang on, but over time, I'm hopeful you, well, I know you'll get stronger, so I'm hopeful that over time you'll be able to consistently do it, so that way, eventually, you can just keep sitting and standing, or you can even combine some of the activities like Mel had us do earlier, where we were really opening up the chest big dynamic movements like that, uh, like those that are common in a lot of different Parkinson exercise programs. But you can sit and as you stand, push the back of your palms back, pushing your chest out, bring them down and up. Let's just do 10 of them, right? Why not? Why not take a little medicine, huh? So here we go. One, two, there we go. Three, and you can even get some speech work too. Four, by screaming out those repetitions. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Good, okay. So we've gotten a little exercise. You've gotten to hear me ramble. I'm probably not at all on the slides, but that's okay. Let me just show you a few things here. We'll take the last few minutes to just uh, use the slides to explain some of this. 
So neuroplasticity, a lot of people think of as just use it or lose it. But you see here, there's so many things we just covered. Task specificity. If there's something you're struggling with, if you can build it into your exercise, very helpful. Intensity matters. Time on task matters. You might say, number seven, salience. What's that about? Well, salience is, is it something you want to do? So, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily the type of exercise. If you don't want to do boxing, don't worry about it. There's yoga, there's Tai Chi, there's Zumba, there's dance for Parkinson's, there are cycling events, there are all kinds of options. But the more specific you can be to your needs, in addition to a general aerobic exercise plan, uh, program, the better. When you think about slowing the progression, this is a highlight. Hey, this Mike, highlights a step. Sorry. Yeah. Mike, what, what slide should I be on so people can see? What is it? Oh, say? gosh. Sorry. I thought I was That's okay. still screen sharing. No, no, no. I'll do it. It's okay. Which, I just want to make sure I'm on the right one. Uh, head back a few. Sorry, I lost, lost sight of this completely. No problem. Keep going. There we go. Okay. I'll, I'll advance them. Go for it. No big deal. So this is just a highlight of a study that shows um, that intensity is a big deal to slow the progression of symptoms. And when you think about intensity, we can move forward a bit. Um, in fact, I think I can even go back to sharing my screen to make it even easier. I just stopped mine, so go for it. When you think about intensity, here's a whole list of stuff that includes intensive aerobic exercise. Some of our folks do pole walking or hiking. Some people just use aerobic machines like you'd find at the gym. What matters most to slow the progression is the level of intensity. And the key here is to go hard, but not too hard. So meaning uh, if you're looking at this rating of perceived exertion scale, if zero is like you just woke up from a nap and 10 is the maximum effort you could do uh, or you could put forth, hopefully you're starting or you're arriving and staying somewhere between a four out of 10 and a seven or an eight out of 10. And that's a big deal because if you overdo, you can have a short-term spike in symptoms. And, and I know that can also set people back on their wellness or their fitness journey. Uh, whereas if you can moderate a bit, which is tough for everybody to do, uh, but if you can dial back the intensity and focus more on consistency, you're going to find some big improvements. You might say four out of 10. What does that mean? Well, raking leaves in the fall counts as a four out of 10 or walking at a moderate pace uh, counts. Even Tai Chi counts, even though we move really slowly, and it's because of the slowness of movement that it counts. Uh, for strength and for flexibility, I've got some other things in the slides that you can revisit in the future. I put those in there as tools to help you. Um, but a lot of it comes down to this slide of uh, for strength and for flexibility, in general, this this guy from The Simpsons, Montgomery Burns, you see him here, he's got the classic Parkinson posture. If you can stretch what's tight, which are usually muscles on the front of the body, and then if you can strengthen what's weak, which are usually muscles on the back of the body, it just puts you in so much better of a position to have upright posture, which, which makes it easier to keep your center of mass over your base of support. That doesn't... Um, take care of everything for balance. You know, there are a lot of other components of balance, but when you think about joint function and when you think about putting yourself in a position to do well for balance control, that is a very big deal. So uh, as you dig through this, hopefully you'll dig through it in your free time. You can see ways to work on strength. I've got lists of, of chronically uh, weak muscle groups. If you see a personal trainer, maybe you could 
show them that and say, well, this is pretty common, just like that of normal aging. Uh, I've got ways to work on flexibility. And if you wanted to hop on uh, a, a variety of different apps, like those have been mentioned, or even look for workout videos on YouTube or the, or the Davis Finney website, you know, you could look for ways to work on some of these chronically tight muscles too. Um, and for those, the biggest thing is just time under tension. How can you stretch them with a prolonged hold? Uh, often 90 seconds is like the magic number for changing the length and tension relationship on tight muscles. So I've got some other basics for thinking about balance, but all of this stuff can be summarized by what Jack LaLanne, uh, the godfather of fitness once said, it's not what you do some of the time that counts, it's what you do all of the time that counts. And, and that means, yeah, there's a day, there are days where you're gonna need to give yourself a pass. But, but really this shows that consistency is key. So uh, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to dig into some of this. I'm sure you'll have questions. We can talk about those in the panel. Um, if there are more, I'm sure uh, you can let Mel or the foundation know, and I'm happy to do whatever I can to help. But the big deal is get active, stay active, stay safe. And in the current environment, as crazy as it sounds, there's, there have never been more opportunities to learn from great teachers and to get active. In fact, um, my friend Steve says it best, and I'll, I'll close with this. He says, workout classes are kind of like going to a bar. Sometimes you go to a bar and you don't feel like you fit in. That's okay. You could always go to another. Meaning, uh, if you don't like one group, try another. And in the current environment, there are so many options out there that I'm convinced all you need to do is show up and, and watch the magic happen from taking some action. Thank you all.